Well, yes, thanks again for being here at our, the last session of the day. Congratulations to all of you for making it through a day of uh, energy policy. It's very exciting stuff. So um, we're going to be talking today about how the grid is changing um, as we both integrate more renewable generation and turn to electricity to help us decarbonize other areas of our lives, like buildings and transportation. Obviously, there are really compelling reasons to decarbonize. Climate scientists have been really clear that if we continue burning fossil fuels the way that we have in the past, we won't be able to avoid the worst effects of climate change. And electrification can help us do that. But it is going to involve some significant changes, increasing the amount of energy that's produced, and taking measures to ensure that the grid operating with a lot of renewables is reliable. In New England, every state except New Hampshire has a climate target, which creates opportunities and pressures. Um, and it's important to note that emissions from the grid have decreased significantly in the past 20 years because of turning off coal, slowly adding renewables, and reducing peak emissions when the dirtiest generators do get turned on. But unlike fossil fuels, you can't turn on the sun or the wind, and so obviously this creates some new considerations about how to manage the grid and make sure that it's both reliable and resilient. So there's some concerns about keeping the lights on when you have a grid that's predominantly powered by intermittent resources. Um, so my name is Amanda Goki. I cover energy and the environment for the New Hampshire Bulletin. Um, we're an independent nonprofit news organization that covers the state house and state policy. And our articles are online and they're available to other papers in the state to republish for free. We send out a daily newsletter. Um, so please consider subscribing if you haven't already. Um, and I'm joined by our three panelists and energy experts for a discussion on this transition today. Um, so we have Molly Connors, who is a policy analyst manager at the New England Power Generators Association. Um, that's a trade or association that represents more than 90% of the region's electricity genera generation capacity. She joined NEGPA in March of 2022. Congratulations on the new gig. Um, before that, she was a part of ISO New England's external affairs team. And ISO, as probably many of you are aware, is the independent nonprofit that's responsible for operating the regional electric grid. And Molly worked there for six years. Um, Ryan Doggerty? Doggerty? OK. Works on business development for um, ISO New England and utility level demand response programs that are available in New England. He works on innovative solutions to help cities, companies, and consumers create a more sustainable power grid. And Mike Conway, Conway is New Leaf, New Leaf Senior Director of Business Development for Energy Storage. He's developed 200 megawatt hours of energy storage across New England and New York, and he currently manages New Leaf's six gigawatt hour, is that right? Energy storage development pipeline. Um, so we're gonna be hearing from all of them today about their work in those areas and how it pertains to creating a resilient grid in the future. So we're gonna start um, with the discussion, some sort of rapid fire questions with our panelists so, so they'll each have some time to speak more about this topic. Um, and we are gonna save some time at the end for audience questions. So if something comes up and you have a question, please jot it down and save it for the end. We'll make sure to have a good amount of time for some Q&A with um, all of you. So I wanted to start by having each of our panelists speak a little bit more about what the future grid might look like and how a variety of approaches are going to play into our evolving energy ecosystem. So Molly, I wanted to start with you. In your current role, you represent the folks who are gonna be supplying energy and we know we're gonna need more supply in the future. So what does this look like from your perspective? Hi everyone. I, I couldn't resist bringing pictures. Um, and I can move because too, I, I find wherever you're comfy. Wherever you're comfy. Um, so um, as Amanda mentioned, I represent 90% um, of the installed capacity in New England. Our members are essentially the power plants that are not owned by a utility. Um, our members have just about every type of fuel in their portfolio. We represent. Um, so roughly in New England, about 20,000, more than 20,000 megawatts of capacity. And in New Hampshire, 
I wrote it down. Um, we have about 2,700 megawatts of capacity just in New Hampshire. And of that 2,700, 1,300 are carbon free and 178 are renewables. As, a cor as, a, as an organization, we represent um, more megawatts of renewable energy than any other uh, trade association in New England, in the state, or in the country. Um, so it's important to state from the outset that our members recognize that we operate in a context in New England. Now some of our, I have 17 member companies, they're very diverse in terms of the portfolio that they own and their business model, how they make money off of their portfolio. But, and so some of them have you know, power plants all over the country, some are really focused locally. Um, and so within New England, they recognize that there is a, a framework that they need to plan for, and that framework is that five of the six states have binding goals to become in some way either carbon free or net, net zero or something along those lines, binding reductions. And New Hampshire has non-binding reductions. So there's definitely some underpinnings um, of, of climate reduction or climate emission reductions in every state in New England. So we know this. And um, this, this is really the chart I wanted to start with, which is that in New England, we have had carbon reductions and there is a good story to tell. And it's mostly been with the power plants. Um, if you look at 1990 as a baseline, which is where a lot of the carbon reduction targets are in terms of public policy and law, the power plants in New England have delivered more than 50% carbon reductions, as I think Amanda mentioned. And the power plants are excited to continue to make that progress. They, um, and the way a lot of that was, was made was through, in New England, we have c competitive markets. And so all of the power plants compete with each other in order to have the opportunity to run and make money. And so they've just driven um, a lot of competition among themselves. And that meant that they were knocking offline things that were more expensive, like coal and oil. And that's why you're seeing these, these reductions. And not only did they go to cheaper fuels, um, they went and they made their power plants more efficient. So even the plants that have been around a while, are t roughly 25% more efficient than they were before because they have an incentive to make more money. <laughs> um, but where we really see a lot of low hanging fruit is in the non-electric generation sector. And that's in transportation and in build, you know, buildings in general, heating and cooling have emissions profiles too. And so if you think about the people of New England and the businesses of New England, if you want to continue to drive carbon reductions, you, you, you can still look at the power plants. They're, the power plants are going to continue to do that under, ver under most circumstances, right? But if you really want to get to, to net zero or carbon free or 100% renewable, if you want to get to the place where you are having a much cleaner atmosphere, if you would, you need to look at transportation where we've actually seen emissions go up by 7% since 1990, and you need to look at home heating. And so what does that mean? It means people need to use more electricity, right? So what we're, um, I, love, I, lo I love data. I'm such a nerd. I've always worked at safe places for nerds. Um, and so <laughs> I'm in a safe place I'm with my fellow nerds. So um, I couldn't help but rip off a chart from ISO New England. I am a little bit partial to that organization because I did work there for six years and they were a good place to work. Um, every year the ISO um, does a forecast of how much demand they think is going to be needed over the next decade. And so every year they redo it because they know that the world is fluid. They know that people are moving, businesses are changing. There's just a lot of um, ebb and flow in a, in, a, in a community, right? So every year they say, well, over the next 10 years, how much electricity demand do we think there's gonna be on the grid? And what do we need to do to plan for it? They also do other studies, but every year they're looking at the load. And a couple, I think two or three years ago, they started saying, well, the states really wanna decarbonize transportation and heating. What does that mean for electricity demand? And so they started folding that into their 10-year forecasts. And this is a relatively conservative forecast. There are other forecasts that indicate even more electricity demand. But what the ISO is saying is in the next 10 years, and this is released every May, in the next 10 years, there's going to be roughly a million more heat pumps throughout New England. And they break it down by state, but I didn't pull that. Sorry. Um, and there's going to be roughly a million and a half more transport um, electric vehicles. Did I get that right? Yeah. And oh, other way around. I'm sorry. Well, no. So anyway, what they're saying is there's going to be a lot more demand for electricity. <laughs> and in particular, it's going to be demand in the winter. 
the demand changes in the winter. Um, and that's really because people recognize if you want to decarbonize, you need to look at the low hanging fruit in these non-electric sectors. The electric sector has other, does have mandates and is working to decarbonize, but where you're going to see a lot of change on the grid is actually in demand. And so what we think that means, and well, we can just leave it. I think we should just leave it here. Um, what, we, what we know it means, there've been a lot of studies. What does this mean? Most, if not all studies done and I think it's an open and fair question, but a lot of studies done are indicating that not only are you going to need a, a lot more new renewable generation, you are going to need to keep the existing units online. And that includes hydro, includes nuclear, includes natural gas, in some cases maybe oil. I think the question is, how do you make sure that the existing infrastructure is being dispatched so that you're using it as efficiently as possible. And so making sure that we find that next, that next step. How do you make sure that the power plants we have are the most efficient and the least polluting as possible while still maintaining reliability, maintaining reliability is really what we're envisioning as a membership and as an organization. And I think I said enough. No, like that, I said, was, I that was great. And we're definitely gonna have a chance to talk a little bit more about sort of like the future of fossil fuels and how those will play in and how those will have an important role moving forward, what that role looks like. Um, so unlike fossil fuels, obviously, renewable energy operates intermittently when the sun is shining or when the wind is blowing. So Mike, I wanted to hear from you about why storage will be so important in the future of the grid. Thank you very much. Great job with your intro too. And great job, Molly. I, everything Molly said, I was gonna say as well, which is I've been in two separate, um, well, now I don't have to say it, so thank you. Um, I've been in two separate uh, of these tracks today, one talking about heat pumps, one talking about electric vehicles and decarbonizing, decarbonizing those sectors. And what that means for both of those is adding more electricity to our demand. And so not only do we need to sort of be smart about how we keep generators running, but we need to add a ton of new capacity. And if a ton of that new capacity ends up being renewable, offshore wind, um, hopefully existing gigawatt or so of hydro that we have, um, then we need energy storage as an enabling technology to balance those resources. Um, because not only are they intermittent in the sense that they're there and they're not there, but that intermittency causes other problems and phenomena within the electrical system, like frequency regulation issues, and volt bar issues. And energy storage um, is a great tool as it can serve many of those needs at the same time um, and also serve sort of as a, a, a direct participant in the capacity market. Um, and yeah, I mean, right, I think right now, ISO New England, generally speaking, is pretty long on capacity. And some of the stuff's probably not going away. Seabrook, Millstone, like stuff's going to be here. And it's not, that's not carbon emitting. So we have that to build on. Um, but Mystic you know, it's two gigawatts. It's tried to retire for like five years straight. Um, it's not going to be around forever. And that's two gigawatts of capacity that we have to backfill with renewable energy. And I've been developing renewable energy for 10 years. It's tough to develop renewable energy fast, especially here in the Northeast. We have a lot of um, permitting checks boxes. Some would call it red tape. I think it's just, you know, like good decision making. Um, so we've got to get this stuff done and get it done in the appropriate way and it's not going to happen overnight. So uh, see so yeah, how we need to be smart about it. And I think on the same page about, uh, certainly on the same page about some of these um, uh, cleaner natural gas assets staying on sort of in an interim case for the foreseeable future until not just renewable energy in its nameplate capacity meets the peak of ISO New England, but actually exceeds it by quite a lot because you need a lot of reserve capacity. Even if we were just using traditional base load generation, you need a lot of reserve capacity. And if that reserve capacity is now inherently intermittent, you need even more reserve capacity on top of that. So we're not going to get to the point where we can be a resilient, reliable, 100% renewable system for quite some time. Um, though I think it seems like most of the new, uh, most of the new installed capacity starting a couple of years ago is all is the vast majority of it will be, will be renewable um and energy storage has a huge role to play in that although i didn't really talk about it right now i feel like we'll get to it later yeah yeah you want to say a bit about it now um well there's a couple things we know as we as we think about the changing grid um we're going to be moving assets uh the generation assets um are going to move from place to place right um 
we're going to put renewables where we can put them. And that's not necessarily where the other thing you're replacing used to be. And that geographical separations means that you now have a transmission problem where if your new thing is, say, Seabrook decommissions, we can't put a 1.5 gigawatt solar plant where Seabrook was, but we can put six gigawatts of offshore wind like down off the vineyard. That's not going to interconnect where Seabrook was. It's going to interconnect somewhere else. And so now we have a transmission related challenge. Um, and what I mean by that is like you've got traffic and congestion in terms of getting that new power, those new gigawatts to where the load centers are, which is also another thing that's not likely to move. Like Boston's not moving. That's where most of the power that we generate needs to go. It needs to go to Southeastern Mass. And so, you know, as so we go to the chalkboard and sort of draw, draw what we think the, um, the geographical and electri electrical connections of a very high renewable system are going to look like, some of those things are going to stay very consistent. And that the reason that in the, because those things are staying consistent, they're going to be sort of um, degrees of freedom that we don't have constraints on how we solve that problem. And so finally, I'm getting to energy storage. I apologize for the long road it took here. Energy storage is a great way of dealing with those constraints. So if you now have a constraint coming from Cape Cod, where offshore wind is coming onto our transmission system and getting that power up into Boston. You have sort of a traffic jam there. Great spot for energy storage. Let's put a bunch of energy storage in the SEMA pocket of ISO New England and make sure that we can smooth out the power as it gets from this new generation center that's gonna be out in the Atlantic to where the load is, which is you know Boston, Providence, Connecticut, and some up here. Thank you. Um, so Ryan is a demand response expert, and this really touches on how energy users can participate in making the grid of the future work. Um, so Ryan, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the role that businesses and individuals have to play in the grid of the future. Yeah, like um, Amanda said, we do demand response. For those that aren't familiar, demand response is a program in which the largest energy users are paid pretty significant amounts of money to potentially reduce their power in moments of critical failures on the grid, right? So ISO New England runs the program. Um, it's available in New Hampshire. Eversource and National Grid also have their own program, but essentially it's like an insurance plan for the grid. So in these very rare moments where the grid is forecasting that they're going to fail or, you know, demand is going to outpace supply, and it's blackout and power quality issues, we dispatch our network with hundreds of companies, thousands of sites in New England to in a coordinated response to reduce some parts of the usage. So reduce the HVAC, non-essential lighting, some production load and backup generation where you can, and also battery storage. Essentially what this is is a flexible resource to get the grid back into, into safer levels. So pretty straightforward kind of um, from why that is, helps resiliency wise. It's a, another tool in the toolkit, a rapid response, and it's flexible, right? These are sites that are doing different things and, and helping out and raising their hand and saying, you know, we might be able to help. Um, but the financial returns is pretty significant. Additionally, we get early warnings of blackouts, which for manufacturing is basically the key um, to protect our people, protect their equipment. Helps with the renewable conversation because I think the loudest critique is the intermittence of resources. Um, and what the demand response can do is, is essentially flexibility. It can afford some flexibility in the grid to kind of close the gaps that the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining. And we're at a generation of power mix that's not sustainable or reliable, which is why I assume it is, is so focused on. Um, and demand response, I think, plays this really cool part. The other side of it is that it's absolutely no cost to customers. Uh, these facilities, if they're not able to, to show up when asked, there's no harm, no foul, the way that they're structured. Um, and it creates this um, takeaway where we're getting the largest, most dense power uses on the grid to look at their energy differently. We're not a fix, I need more one way street. We're looking, we're saying, do you have flexibility? As the largest users, biggest companies, can you help the communities that you're in? We're talking about couple hours a year at most. It's very rare moments that it's called enough and it's not called. Um, but it's, they always say like insurance. You don't need it until you need it. And in these situations where 
Let's look at Texas. These are available all across deregulated markets in North America. In Texas, with the massive issues last winter with the loss of generation, demand response was really crucial. A massive role, I believe, was the longest demand response event that's ever happened. Usually, these are about an hour at a time that you're asked to reduce. In Texas, I think, was 24 hours straight they were asked to, to pull up. So, what it does is it helps avoid um, a forced outage, helps a lot of people. I think we saw some news with the charging. Helps avoid forced outages. It helps avoid uh, using peaking power plants, right? So in these rare moments, when the, you know, the, I think the the jury's out on if you have a power plant, we're using it one percent of the time. Uh, you know, it's not effective or efficient for any part of the grid. It goes on for great grid. So Grant wants to, as a resource to get about 120 megawatts in New England of power at a given point that we can dispatch in a very fast amount of time. Uh, in, in seven gigawatts internationally. So um, it's an important tool. It's an interesting tool. I find that not too many people know about it. Everybody knows about it. Say it again. Everybody knows about it. What can we do with the residential level for demand response? What can we do with the residential level for battery storage? Why can't we have time varying rates at the residential level? Well, well get it, large scale. Like, sure. It. What about residential? Well, frankly, for demand response, the reason that sites are participating is a the financial opportunity. And these are the most energy dense spots. So how many houses, you know, instead of why don't we just go to a factory and get two megawatts of our cabin? But but we, there's no opportunity, it seems no opportunity in every source community in Canada to do demand response, local energy storage, anything. We don't have anything. Right? We have nothing. That chart that you're showing there, how many individuals would pull off that thing if we as individuals in our own homes were able to play the game? We can't play it. Well, so one of the things we are going to talk about is, um, it's sort of at the end of the list, but we might be able to bump it up, I guess. But um, we're talking about like transactive energy rates and how rate design can involve people in their homes to a greater degree so that people can participate. Um, well, so the New Hampshire Electric Co-op, it's something that they're looking at doing transactive rates. Um, and so there's certainly, I think it's a policy proposal that folks would have to put forward and we'll see. That's certainly something I'm gonna be interested to follow in the in the legislature this session and we'll see in November what, um, what that will look like, I guess. Um, so I did wanna talk a little bit and just dive deeper into sort of the role of fossil fuels and what that will look like in the grid moving forward. You mentioned, Molly, sort of how much um, cleaner the electricity generation has become in the past and mentioned, you know, there is further to go on that front. Um, but I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about sort of the future of fossil fuels and weighing that with reliability. Um, you know, if is it reasonable to envision a grid that is completely free of, of fossil fuels? Um, so yeah. So, and I think um, I think what I'm anticipating what I'm about to say is something that um, my my co-speakers will probably um, echo, which is that my members are competitors with one another, and so what they what they would say is, "Tell us what you want, and we will we will give it to you." Right, And so the grid says, I need energy, I need capacity, I need frequency or voltage support. The engineers in other rooms are the ones who can tell you more about what the frequency market is and things like that. And, and my members would say, we can, we will get it to you. You tell us what constraints you need, just be clear, make it fair, we will get there. And, um, and so, I think it would be fraught for me to say <laughs> whether one of my members who might have, you know, a fossil fuel unit and another one who competes with the fossil fuel unit, I don't know that I can, that we would really even be in a position to know. I think what we are finding is that if public policies in which we operate are saying we want less reductions, we're, you know, we're looking at what outcome do you want? You want less carbon in the atmosphere. You want improved public health outcomes. And so we would say, okay, we have reduced those, the emissions. We can help you reduce the emissions in the other areas. So we, you know, if you have, if you switch people to EVs and you switch people to heat pumps, 
they need to know that that heat pump is going to perform if there is a really cold week. And they really need to know that if their kid is sick, they need to get to the doctor. I mean, I don't think that that's I think that that's a reasonable expectation that consumers have. We've historically had really reliable service in New England in terms of electricity. And so I think the question is really, what do you want? You could completely remove all carbon from the electric grid. And if you never move people off of fossil fuels for home, for home heating, and they're always going to be driving cars with horrible emissions output, then are we really going to get the outcome that our public policy says that we want? And so that's really how my members think. They, you know, they're, they're, they're power plant people. They go in and they run turbines and they run, they do maintenance on, on, you know, wind turbines. Way up and, you know, these are people that are really um, focused on problem solving. So they would say, what problem do you want? We can help you get there. If you want us to run a natural gas plant, much less. And I think that's the direction that everyone acknowledges public policy is directing. Help us, help us keep in business. I think that the long run shows that even sort of what storage, you know, what we were saying about storage, you want to get to a point where most of the time you're running on renewables, but once in a while you're going to need backup. And that's really where the existing power plants come into play. And that's really where public policy needs to be specific, I think. You can say, I want a carbon-free grid. Well, that's different than I want a 100% renewable grid. Or you can say, I want 100% um, reliable and I don't care about emissions. I don't know anyone who would say that. But, you know, it just be, you know, we, have a, we will operate the grid, the, the grid, we will run the grid that you tell us to run. And I think we're the, we consider ourselves sort of the backbone for making sure that the, electric, the electricity that people want will be reliable and affordable. And so that's, that's sort of where we stand. We say we can help you get the electricity and stay affordable and reliable. I think, you know, we, we don't necessarily have the tools that we need to, to get all the fossil um, retired off the grid right now. It, you know, you think about if you were to try to do this all with battery, you start to need some seasonally long store long duration storage battery right because if we get a cold snap in december when all of the pv plants are running at 30 percent capacity factor the batteries that weren't the batteries that i'm installing today are between two and four hour duration batteries in order to make it through one of those cold snaps you need a two and four week long battery and there's some companies that are working on that right now there's a company out of mit called form energy who's doing some great work on uh, iron oxide batteries um, and it's gonna take a while for the cost to come down on that but we, we don't necessarily have all of the two well I uh, uh, challenge that we could probably do it if we wanted to add more nuclear back into the mix um, but that's you know pretty <laughs> that yeah that can be, that, can be uh, that could be a controversial as well um, yeah, and uh, well, we're going to talk about winter peaking later, right? Yes, we I'll will. My we'll thoughts get on to winter, winter peaking, peaking later, but that's yeah. Yeah, real challenge for National Grid is the winter uh, for natural gas. Sorry, I used to work at National Grid. Um, for natural gas is what we do in the winter because we have a lot of natural gas heating load here in the Northeast, and it get you probably know more about this than I do, but it gets first dibs on the natural gas supply. So you have to, if you're a natural gas power plant you may not be able to get the gas in the pipeline that you need because people are using it to heat their homes. And so you can't run. And so, you know, either way, we need to be, <laughs> if we want to go full renewable, we need to be way longer than we need to be on renewable capacity because you're only going to get a percentage of it at any given point in time, and the winter is the most challenging time. And now compound that with the fact that if we tr fully transition to heat pumps, winter is where the peak is going to be, you know, then you've got that yeah, you've got that challenge really concentrated in one spot. Yeah. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that, Ryan? I, I was just thinking as you're saying this, you know, do we have the tools? And I, I think that they're there, and, and really it's a crux of innovation. But unfortunately, we don't have the time to wait to have the perfect plan in place to then put it in place if we're going to hit these goals. So it's sort of building the car while driving it, I, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, but what I think is we need to put all the toolkits, all the tools in the toolkit see what works best and just start making some progress towards the goals that we have because if we don't then we're you know the ISO New England we're, we're not going to hit these clean energy goals that, that net zero goals that we have so it's going to take a lot a lot of the work that I think 
the three of us chatted about, but then technologies that we don't know yet or aren't widely adopted yet. Well, and the other thing that I wanted to, if you don't, guys don't mind, we'll, we can take questions for sure at the end. We're going to save a lot of time for that. Um, I wanted to talk a, a little bit as well. Something that came up when we were sort of preparing for this session was that there's still compelling reasons to switch from a sort of combustion engine, for example, to an electric vehicle that have to do with efficiency. I don't know, Molly, if you wanted to speak to that or who makes, who would like to, could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, you go. Right now, for, for the transportation sector, like it's the tool we have and it's here and it's you know crossed over the threshold from, yes, this is, an, this is a theoretical engineering tool that like people, electrical engineering manager, majors like me are excited about over to like into the masses a thing that people want because electric cars are cool now, right? Um, there, I don't, I don't see that coming from a lot of other areas other than just electricity. When you have to charge that car, you've got to plug it in and get that power from the grid. And right now it's coming from whatever mix. As the grid decarbonizes, it will more and more be low carbon fuel. But right now you're charging with whatever's out there. Um, hydrogen, as far as I know, like some public buses and forklifts are kind of the only real victories for hydrogen as a, as a fuel for, um, as a fuel for transportation. Um, so on, you know, warehouses and forklifts and stuff like that. I, I, maybe it's out there. I'm a, I'm a little bearish on hydrogen for transportation. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sure. Um, so I thought we could talk a little bit now about winter peaking. Obviously, right now, peak electrical usage, so the time when there's the highest demand for energy, occurs in the summer. Um, this might be when there's a heat wave and everyone has their AC on. Uh, full blast, but as Molly's mentioned, projections indicate that in the future, when more people are using electricity to heat their homes, this could start occurring during the winter time. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the significance of this shift and what has to be done to prepare for it. Yeah, so demand response really targets these peaks, right? And it happens in the winter when we lose generation or usually high heat and everyone's heading home and cranking the, the AC and businesses haven't quite come down. So as that peak changes and grows, and again, we more base load, we're gonna have more peaks. Um, essentially, that's where we advocate for more demand response. Um, and it's gonna be those, you know, have it funded and, and have the program run and supported. Um, for instance, in New Hampshire, uh, with the PUC hasn't funded the, the Eversource and the, the Eversource side of demand response. So we just have the ISO New England program. When in other areas in Massachusetts and Connecticut where we have those layers, again, sites participate in this program because of the dollar figures. We've moved from the sustainability report to the balance sheet, and that's where we're getting people's attention with the C-suite. Um, but when you stack those revenue stacks, you then further push more participation, right? If I pay you double what this is, more people get interested. But it also drives the battery adoption as well because oftentimes demand response is in this revenue stack that's allowing for batteries to then pencil out and be viable investment for us and then also for the, for the companies there as well. So more tools, I, I think, and, and again, the same idea driving the car while we're building it. Um, we're gonna need every option we can as this, because it's never happened before, right? I mean, that's gonna be moving to a winter peak yeah, I mean, maybe Texas, where, where else would... Wait, My, if we were at pub trivia, I would say, <laughs> um, his, I think in the very early years of the New England Power Pool, when the, the Power Pool is, now it's a stakeholder body, but back in the day in the 70s, the power plants all joined together and said, we're gonna pool all our resources so we can be more efficient. I believe New England did have a winter peak because people were using that baseboard electric heat. Hmm. And so I think some of, it might not have been all the states though, but they're way back in the, you know, this is one of those ones where I would go up to the opera, well, back when I worked at the ISO, I would say, you know, in the way back machine, um, and actually in parts of, so I'll just, okay, so I'll talk about the winter peak now, because I love the winter peak. Um, that is one thing I will say about as we move to electrification, a lot of New Englanders remember that terrible baseboard heat it was expensive, it burned your, your, your blankets if it was too close to the bed, it was just horrible. Um, what we now all know is that the, um, the heating that we're using that's electric is much more efficient than that old nasty stuff. Um, and so, I, you know, so everyone, I think a challenge New England has that the power plants, everyone is sort of living with right now is 
has been alluded to a couple of times that we have built a, a, um, a generation fleet, a power generation fleet in New England that um, runs a lot on natural gas. And when it's really cold, um, the people use the people who are heating with natural gas have first dibs on what comes through the pipes. And so what's left over is available for the power plants. Um, and what we find is when it's really cold, those pipelines are at capacity. You can't move more gas even if you wanted to. Or what's left uh, that's available is so expensive that it's no longer cost effective to be burning that natural gas. It's actually cheaper to move to, to oil or to coal. Um, although coal is kind of an outlier because it is such a, a rarely burned um, source in New England now. Um, and I think that's where the, this is where the ISOs, uh, you know, a lot of regional stakeholders are working on a question that says, well, how much can you really rely on these power plants? And not just, not just renewables, you know, not just, um, not just a wind farm or a battery. People are really saying, well, how much can you really rely on a natural gas plant in the winter? Because we know you have a pipeline problem or you're super dependent on an international LNG sh tip, um, shipment. Or how much can we really rely um, on an oil plant? Like how efficient or how well run is that oil plant? And so the ISO and um, stakeholders started a process where they are working through completely re-examining how every single power plant or class of power plant, um, how much can we rely on them? And so, you know, if you put on, in certain parts of the grid, I think we were sort of talking about this, like one megawatt of electricity is not as valuable as another megawatt in another area, right? Just because the location of your electricity matters based on where the demand is and the, and the constraints that the, that the wires have. Um, so the grid is saying, you know, if you put another megawatt of, I'm gonna pick on solar, but I promise to pick on gas too. Mm -hmm. um, if you put another megawatt of solar in an area that already has a ton of solar and on a winter day, that's, that next megawatt of solar, how much does that really help you on a winter day? It's, it's pushing the peak later. It helps you other times of day. But what pro we go back to what problem are you trying to solve? Similarly, if you were to build, although I, if you were to build another natural gas plant on a pipeline that already is subscribed to, you would say, on a really cold winter day, how much do we know that we can rely on their ability to get gas if we also don't have LNG or, you know, or how much can you, so everyone, and that's a huge question and it, it's going to be a huge process, it's already underway. And so this is my way of saying, you know, this, what do we do in the winter is a really hard question because we know that renewables can help. It's not that re not, renewables are inherently less reliable, it's that they're dependent on weather. But the ISA will tell you they've got statisticians and consultants working all the time to be able to predict what the weather is going to be. It's hard with climate change, but they, we, you know, so they're getting better and better at knowing. It's not that the engineering is different. It's, you know, it's that they're engineers, that's what they do. Um, so, you know, so one really fundamental question is you need to understand what the power plants can do in a given circumstance. And that's not an easy question, which is why it's going to be like a year or two process at the stakeholder regional level that the ISO is really leading. And I think that's really important. I think it will drive a lot of important conversations. Um, and to take it another step, we believe in NEPCA, we believe in markets. I'm, we're unapologetically markets. We want to compete. Tell us what you want. Our we are competitors, they will, they will innovate. And so that's where carbon pricing to us is very important. I know that that's a very politically sensitive thing to raise, we're not, I'm not dumb. <laughs> um, but we say if you price the carbon, those power plants that are still on in the winter when things are tough, they will compete to reduce the carbon because they know that less and less fossil fuels are going to be burned to maintain reliability. So you wanna make sure that the power plant you're running that is a fossil fired unit is the most efficient possible. And if you can just tell them they'll make more money that way, that'll, be, that'll get a much better outcome than just saying, don't burn, a, don't burn a fossil fuel, you know? Anyway, I've definitely gone over my time. Yeah, I think I'm going to add something. But I, I, I'm going to ask Molly just to jump in front of it if I say something wrong here because I'm not a gas expert. I'm not either. Um, it, but I think this drives. I think this is going to drive home the point about the challenge in winter, which is that Mystic. So, uh, people know what I'm talking about when I say Mystic. But Mystic is a two gigawatt power plant in Everett, Mass, right outside of Boston. Um, Mystic is not on pipeline, right? Mystic takes LNG, so. 
the 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 condition we were talking about earlier where you've got a lot of people using gas for heating fuel and you have to ramp down your your power plants mystic is insulated from that challenge because they're using on-site storage tanks of natural gas of liquefied natural gas not using gas in the pipeline and because of that because they're that sort of reserve resource for winter for winter time um ISO New England has been telling them you cannot retire your plant. <laughs> Mystic has put in, I don't know how many years in a row, a request to retire the power plant. And they get slapped with this thing from ISO New England called a, a RMR, Reliability Must Run, um, that says, thank you for your bid to retire, but you can't retire. Because we need, we need you online. They can retire. They have big penalty? No, so they can retire. So I love these rules um, because I spent a long time trying to explain them to people who don't love them. Um, the ISO cannot require a power plant to operate against its will. It's a free country. You can't, you can't tell a grocery store you have to stay open. Or you can, but by and large, they don't have that authority. They can't say to a, a plant, you want to go. But what happens is if, they can, if the ISO can demonstrate that there's a reliability need for them, they can say, okay, I can't make you stay but I will give you however much money you want. And you have to justify that amount of money. And Mystic, to this point, so glad I don't work at the ISO anymore. Mystic has been a con incredibly, um, for this reason I like the ISO, um, has been an incredibly expensive contract for people. Um, so what happened is this huge power plant in, new, in the heart of Boston wanted to retire because they were so expensive they couldn't recover the costs in the markets. They said, we want to go. And the ISO said, we really, really need you. You're 2,000 megawatts in the big load zone. And so the ISO went through a very controversial, heated process to tell everyone in the region, you should keep this power plant and we will make the power plant whole, but the power plant is very expensive. And that was the whole reason the power plant wanted to retire because it was expensive and it wasn't recovering its costs. Um, it is, an, and it's, the problem has not gone away. So the power plant is saying it's going to retire. The ISO is saying we're gonna allow it to retire but now we're really worried about the gas supply. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so that's going to show up on, I, I hate to say it, but, and this is where I think someone who deals maybe with load, these are the kinds of charges that people pay on their bills. Um, all of us are paying for the power plant in, New, in Boston. Yeah. It's a, this is an ongoing, very challenging, um, this is just a really challenging time in, in winter in particular, I think. I, I, and I think that when we, it's just so, I mean, and I just feel, I think we all feel for people who are looking at these prices coming in. I, I think you can, sorry, I'm just talking too much. It's a challenging time. Did you have anything else on that? Okay, I think we wrapped that up. Did you have anything else you wanted to add to that? Okay, great, thanks. Um, so I want to talk about some of the concerns, obviously, that come along with this new grid. People have you know, blamed renewables for brownouts and blackouts in both California and Texas. That was something that Ryan mentioned. Um, so I wanted to put the question to our panelists about how you make a grid that is largely powered by renewables reliable, and if we can prevent the threat of these power outages in the future, what that looks like. Do you want to start with this? You know, how do you make them reliable? I, I think, um, I, I guess we can't say nuclear, right? We said not to say we that. But, yeah, sure. Um, I think that it's uh, the biggest thing, especially with Texas, is is that there's a lot of people that put out noise that don't necessarily know what what they're talking about. And I think that's probably the biggest headwind of the situation is that you, it's there's a political aspect to it where it's not just let's figure it out. We have a problem at hand. Let's figure it out. And I think we all know that's not how politics work. Um, so I think when you um, just decide as a whole society, I guess, in a bigger, what do we want out of the power grid? And what do we need out of the power grid? And then finding a way to, to balance that. So to get it away from, I guess, the trendy buzzwords on one end, then stop the, try to remove it or distance it from the political conversation. And then I, th I think markets. I, I think that f let companies develop business models that attract every stakeholder that makes sense. And again, move from that we're, we're talking about balance sheets for companies, like their, their bottom line, and it now makes more sense to, to be involved in this. So I essentially think the answer is to uh, get the bureaucracy, the red tape out of the way and let the markets 
play themselves and innovate themselves and, and it will end up being a reliable, affordable because it has to be and that's what the market's demanding. Yeah, I think um, we've got, we've been a little luckier so far in ISO New England that we haven't, we haven't had to deal with the um, network level resiliency issues like they've seen in California, they see in Texas. And so our resiliency issues, I think mostly as I think about them are more localized. You, you were talking about people maybe within your own home. I mean, we get most of our big outages here from, you know, Hurricane Irene, a big windy storm or early season freeze where the leaves are still on the trees and it takes down a bunch of overhead distribution lines and you've got a half a million customers out for that. But we don't tend to tend to lose like a third of our transmission system. Um, and so, you know, the challenges there become a little, you know, some of that can be borne more on the consumer. Like if you want to install um, solar on your own roof uh, with a battery backup system or an electrical ve electric vehicle that has like a V to G option where you can sort of have backup power from your car, backup, you know, charge your car with your solar panels, have, have your car provide backup power back into the main panel of your house and keep a couple things open while the crews are getting the lights back on your house. I think that's a that's an achievable solution um, that I agree with you, sir. I think there it would be a lot more achievable if there was some public policy supporting that. Um, and that's as easy as very, you know, time variable rates, and things like that. Um, but we are, none of us work for Eversource and none of us work for the regulatory commission, so. Um, Do you wanna say a little bit more about those, that kind of rate design um, and, and how that could sort of incentivize people in their homes to make some of these changes, what that would look like? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, it, it, it kind of teaches you the habits of demand response every day there's a pretty good program in new york called uh v veter v-d-e-r um that has their rate broken up into different constituents so you have your energy rate and on top of that you have your capacity rate and on top of that you have this rate called drv which is demand reduction value and that rate for e for every day that you're using energy has some time period where if you are where you're just it's just you know, it's like a time variable rate. So if you are operating during that time period, you're gonna get a bill that's associated with that demand, essentially demand charge over that time period. But it's not a flat demand charge the way that some folks in the EV panel were talking about it earlier today, where just like you have demand, you get that charge. In Veter, you only incur that charge if you have that demand during a particular window such that you are coincident with the peak of the rest of the system. So when, this, so when the whole system is having a problem, are you adding to that problem or are you helping that problem? Um, peak usage that is not this anti-correlated with other peak usage, peak usage that's not coincident with peak of the system, it's not so bad. The system is built to handle it. It's sort of spread out over the investment of the rest of the system. Um, but when you're when you have your AC on and everyone else has their AC on, now we're all sort of collectively making a creating a problem. Um, the, the best thing about Veter is that it's bi-directional. That's how you pay for um, uh, that's how you pay for your electricity, and that's how you get compensated for your generation if you have solar, if you have energy, if you have energy storage. So as you as your solar is operating, if you're in that high window where the where the demand peak is you're getting a higher rate for your solar production than you otherwise would. Um, and the rates tend to be, you know, sort of mid to late afternoon. So solar's usually happening, maybe tapering off a little bit, but happening. Uh, and if, the, if your coincident window is too late in the day, then you can go chase that market signal. You can add a battery to your solar system, shift your production to four to 8 p.m. instead of 10 to two and do a better job of capturing that market signal and you will be paid or your bill will be reduced by that amount. And I think that's a, one, of the, one of my favorite rate structures as I've looked at a few throughout the country. What's the mechanism for like alerting folks when it starts getting into that really expensive time of the day? Yeah, it's scheduled. So you know that if you, they, so New York does it by their network. So you know if you're, if you're in a certain neighborhood, your, your peak window is 4 to 8 p.m. And it's gonna be 4 to 8 p.m. until, you know, if it changes, they'll have a big thing when they tell you about it. Okay. So, uh, you know, like Staten Island is 4 to 8 p.m. Like Brooklyn is like 8 to 11 p.m. because it's all cool kids who stay up late. Actually, <laughs> nice. Really, that's how. Did you have anything? Uh, uh, yeah, nothing. And no opportunity to do it. 
I mean, I guess I would say, so all of my, mem most of my members are federally regulated. And so the kinds of programs that we're talking about right here, where human beings are able to interact and, um, you know, the whole electric grid was designed, if you want to put it in economic terms, so that people were not exposed to the prices in real time, right? And so the kinds of things that, um, I just want to address this so you don't keep interrupting us. Um, the kinds of things you want are the kinds of things that need to happen at the state level. And I, and I um, have worked in state government and I know how hard it is, but the, the frustration that you're venting here are things that belong at, in a conversations in a regulatory proceeding or with lawmakers. Um, these guys can sign you guys up, but um, I think the frustration that you're venting at us really belongs directed to someone else. I wanted to talk about something else that came up earlier, which was to the question about technology and what technologies are already available to us versus ones that we might need in the future moving forward to kind of build out this grid that we're talking about. Um, so what else do we need? Do we have the technologies that we need? And if not, what else, what else do we need moving forward? I think the technologies are, are definitely there. And what we find is even simple ones, um, anybody that participates in demand response, we install a, a pulse meter with them. And, and essentially we're using that to stream the data to see what a site's reducing in, in real time. And that's how we settle performance later on. But we turn that around and make it available to the facility 24 seven. So they have a nice platform where they can see their real time energy use with utility grade data. The outcomes of just that visibility and how many organizations and companies and municipalities are using just the electric bill and then a spreadsheet and then trying to glean insights and strategies from that it's very difficult so yes the technologies that are big and fancy and million dollar battery assets are awesome but something as simple as smart metering that's providing new visibility and generating insights that are actionable um, for instance, you know, we have one where the site take a look at their load data and they see that they're really ramping up at 8 a.m. when their first shift starts and their peaks are crazy. They get that visibility and they start thinking, is there a way we can phase in what we're doing? So I think uh, it, it's the same idea. If we can get people to interact with their, and, and just to get to this next level, hey, you, you, there's gotta be some flexibility here. Um, but if you can give them the insights, I, I think metering is, is huge and instrumental to, uh, to just generating or, or sparking the interest to what can we do? What, and then that's one project, what can we do next? So. Yeah, I jotted down to uh, first long duration energy storage. That one seems obvious, talked about it a little bit earlier. There's kind of two flavors of it. Um, right now the dominant uh, energy storage type in chemistry is lithium ion. Um, lithium ion's great under four hours. Between four and six, it's kind of okay. And then over that, um, things start to get a little inefficient. Um, so, so two flavors of long duration that are non-lithium that come after that. And the first sort of picks up at four hours and goes to like 12. That's sort of these like medium long duration um, uh, batteries, a lot of flow batteries. Um, a couple companies do it with like zinc. There's a company at MIT that does it with liquid metal. Um, all really exciting stuff. We have a project with the New York State Ener uh, Research and Development Authority to pilot two of those projects in New York City that we're really, really excited about because they're non-flammable and they're long duration. Um, and then there's the form energy type stuff, which is like seasonal duration energy storage, st stuff that you can store for months and months without having that um, storage capacity degrade to the point where it doesn't make sense to, where it's uneconomical to do that. So long duration storage, yes, all the way. Um, second one that came to mind for me was hydrogen, which um, always gets everyone excited. Um, it's, you know, I think I've, I'm not a hydrogen expert, but my, what I understand about hydrogen is that there are some sort of um, uh, temporary expectation type of things going on with hydrogen. The first being that uh, it's it's much less dense than the uh, methane-based natural gas that we that we use right now, and so. Um, it takes a lot more of it to produce the same energy output that you would with um, that you would with the methane-based nat natural gas. So you're just moving a whole lot more of it to do the same thing. And if it burns a lot cleaner, you know, okay, well maybe maybe we can do that. Um, you know, some of the the sort of no-brainer slam dunk type of scenarios are okay. We've well, got natural gas pipeline. You've got got natural gas turbines and generators. 
let's just get them mixed up with hydrogen. You start putting hydrogen through those, you save a lot of costs on CapEx. And then it turns out that that doesn't really work either because these turbines that were designed for natural gas are not able to burn hydrogen or a hydrogen natural gas mix once it reaches a certain ratio of natural gas to hydrogen. And it's pretty low. I think it's, it's I'm not the expert on it, but it's definitely less than 50%. So you can't even get it to 50-50 without having to retrofit your entire um, high, your entire uh, natural gas turbine. And then downstream of the turbine, the same thing happens with the pipes, where the, the pipes can only, t the t pipeline itself can only take a certain ratio of hydrogen to natural gas. It can't take 100% hydrogen. So a lot of the things that were sort of, I, that at least I found really exciting about hydrogen, um, right when sort of, the, you know, the IRA has a big thing for hydrogen. Uh, there's a hydrogen um, grant coming out from the federal government to build these hydrogen hubs. Some of those things I was really excited about, I've, I've had to temper my expectations on after I just I'll learn a little bit more about how much work has to go into making hydrogen useful in the way that methane-based natural gas is useful for us now. Okay, so I wanted to definitely open it up for, for questions now from the audience. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you. I had a question about coal um, in relation to the bow plant and so on. And it comes back to something you said, Ryan, that demand response could be used to prevent the grid from crashing, yes. But it could also be used to prevent the necessity of peaking plants, if I understood correctly. So I guess my question is if you model or if you can just estimate what it would take in terms of instituting demand response such that, such that the plant in Bow never fired up and could be retired now. Could that be done with demand response in forward capacity options or in some way or another? You know, I think the, the biggest headwind against that is to remember that these large manufacturers, uh, hospitals, wastewater, energy dense facilities, they're not in they're not power generators right so when you start to get into more than five events in a summer typically it's zero to two that they're asked to reduce but you start getting up to five to ten events it no longer is financially viable for these companies the business case starts to decrease so i think that demand response is a an emergency program i don't see it as a a, a, a generation tool it is but i i think it's it's reserved for so I, you would need a lot of demand response, I think, um, but I don't think it'd be a, a totally effective tool to rely on to, to such a degree. That answers your question. Yeah, if I can add to that, I, I think Bo is a, better, a much better candidate for a big battery. Yeah. Um, you know, it depends on how, so for, the first thing you'd have to do is just do a runtime analysis of Bo and say, okay, how many hours a year does it run? You know, if it's under 50 hours a year, if it's under 100 hours a year, um, you can, pretty quickly start to make the math work on, okay, we need a battery that run, it's gonna be five events a year and it's gonna run four hours in each one of those events. And, you know, we can do that predictably with an energy storage system and take, take this asset out of the market completely. Um, that's been a big focus of the, um, uh, the DPS and the other folks working on um, energy design in New York. They commissioned a study of all their peaking plants in New York City and Long Island and did the same runtime analysis and you know basically just put it all up on the map and said, here are the peaking power plants that we can um, remove from the market and here's how much battery storage in each of these load pockets it would take to do that. And um, you know, in a lot of cases, the folks who own those power plants are just like, yeah, we know and we'll just build a pa battery right here in the parking lot and it's done. Um, and so, yeah, I think that like this, this train's left the station already, and you know it's just you know the having a, the the policy support that um, those generators in New York have really helps because it just put it keeps giving them a kick in the behind. Like, go ahead, do this and do this and do this. Um, and you know, I think for Bo, if if the same sort of policy support support existed, you'd be able to get it done. Yeah. Um, Yeah, that was the impact on peak demand. Okay. 
Yeah, I think that, again, it comes down to if we can go to this large factory and get you know, a thousand houses worth of energy reduction, isn't that easier and more effective than getting the thousand houses to reduce? But I think what will happen is the heat pumps and the EVs are going to be all connected, I, 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 like connected to the grid, right? And, and I think that you'll see, whether it's demand response or something similar, they'll be able to respond to, to signals coming in from the grid. I'm just trying to get a sense of the magnitude of that effect. Is it, how much is it going to happen? Yeah, there was recently a, a, a rooftop solar installer called Sunrun. Um, they're, they're, they're very good. They're one of the largest. They took a bunch of, they took an aggregation of customers that they signed up with rooftop systems and energy storage systems and entered them into ISO New England's capacity market auction and received a capacity obligation for that aggregation of customers. So now that, that aggregation of customers together acts as a small power plant right. that is a participant in ISO's system. It's, I think it's under 100 megawatts. Where is that? At ISO New England, yeah. So it can be all. It can be Anywhere. all. Over. Yeah, it could be all over. I just want to add. You know, you say ten percent, like that's nothing. Um, you know, so. No, I'm thinking, like, at the most optimistic. I like optimism. I think that's the way to be. I, I just, I mean, the problems are so big that sometimes you can get discouraged. And what's the point of that? I mean, you're, then you're not going to get anywhere. Um, you know, the, all of that peak demand, I checked my notes, so between now and 2031, I, I noted from the ice, this is not my forecast, it's the ISOs, it says net annual electricity use. So this is the overall gigawatt hours used <coughs> is projected to go up by 1.4%. Now that actually seems small, but in the grand scheme of across New England, that's a lot. And so I think that, um, I mean, if I put my, you know, I. I work for power plants. We, we want to sell you megawatt hours. But, um, you know, when I think about the story of energy efficiency in New England, um, it's actually a story of millions of people across six states saying we want to just change our light bulbs. And we've had, a, you know, so I think that, you know, to the degree that you that people say they want to actually just go get different. I mean, I think that there is cause for hope in terms of even passive demand response. We're talking a lot about active demand response, right. but just energy efficiency measures can have huge impacts. And you've seen, um, not in New Hampshire, but in, um, it was either Connecticut or SEMA, one of the Southern New England transmission projects actually got canceled. The ISO had originally said you need to build um, a little bit more of a reliability line. And then because of energy efficiency, and I think maybe some development, they ended up not needing it. So a little goes a long way. Um, the, yeah, the transactive rate structure that I was referencing is active now in the state of New York. Is that the VITER? VITER, yeah. Okay. Um, there are others that are somewhat like it. Um, California, I haven't done retail in California for a while, but they do have some, uh, a lot of versions of time variable rates that try to get them to, because California has the famous big duck curve, right? Where they get over generation in the middle of the day and they want that generation to be a little bit later in the afternoon. So they install these time variable rates um, that do the same sort of thing just with a different mechanism where they're trying to get people to either face your solar system southwest so that they pick up more afternoon, face them all the way west, or add batteries to them to, um, to shift your production to the west. And I forgot your second question. Uh, the T&D reduction. Yeah, the, most of that I have seen come out uh, has been RFP based. So they'll do these things like uh, non-wire solutions. Um, some t on the transmission side, you hear it called uh, storage as a transmission asset, where you're, do you're, you're building, it's, it's actually what you were just saying, you're, you're using another tool other than your traditional poles and wires tool to serve the need. Um, yeah, the, the utilities in Rhode Island, New York, California, those are the only ones I can think of right now. By re by by regulatory uh, action, had to go ahead and issue several of those per year. So the planning engineers at those utilities go through their um, you know ten worst 
performing feeders and they say, okay, would a battery make this better or would demand response make this better? And then when they put out their non-wires RFP, they'll say, this is a, 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 a technology agnostic RFP. If you're a group of bring your own thermostats, if you can solve the problem, come on, give us your price. If you're one big battery, come give us your price. And whoever has the most efficient price for re either reducing that load or obviating the need for that transmission upgrade, they win the business. Yeah, it's a good model. It just it's it tends to be a little um, uh, it's very targeted. It's, as a developer, it's a hard model to develop into because you have to win the one contract. There's only one contract, and you have to win it from them, rather than being able to like control your own fate a little bit and have an asset that you can wheel and deal. Yeah, if you have a mountain and a pond, it's the best. <laughs> and oh, okay, yeah, yes, about um, hydroelectric store pump storage, um, yeah. which uh, which we do have a ton of in Iceland, New England, Mount Tom, well, Northfield. Northfield is between them, they're over a gigawatt. Um, yeah, you just you know, they're not making any more mountains is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, the pump hydro is great if you've got the, the, the right terrain. Yeah. But you can build a building yeah. that does the equivalent. There's a company you doing this. Lift up yes. the giant masses yes. with a motor and then over the end, you turn that motor into a generator and let it lower. You don't have to even build it up up. You can use it as mines. Yep. Yeah. So, so you can get the same kind of you certainly, I think the company's called Energy Vault, but they're, yeah, they're doing that with uh, like bricks, I think. Yeah. I think we might have time for one more question, if there's a quick one. Yes, in the back. Hi. Um, I had a question about the legacy plants that you mentioned in the beginning and keeping them online. Is there a key part about basic transition to renewable? Um, in the example of the Seabrook nuclear plant recently being um, told by ISO New England that they had to change out the circuit breakers because there would be a little obstructionist to allow other hydropower to come in. Is that the only example of that type of obstruction that we can see from these legacy plants? Are there others that you're anticipating and how would you overcome them? Let me know if I got this right. Um, there was some issue with a legacy fossil plant where they were asked to change out a circuit breaker in order to uh, allow the operation of another pumped hydro facility. Is that correct? Uh, uh, oh, it was a, it was a transmission upgrade yeah, to allow more hydro to come down. Oh. So there was some um, transmission element that was important to the hydro, the hydro coming down from north to south, but that transmission element was at a facility owned by an independent power producer? I think that in order for the, the rate or the type of power to flow from hydro through the, type of, the part of the grid that the nuclear plant is connected to, it, it would have blown their circuit uh -huh. Because it's, it's an antiquated facility, it's 30 years old, so I think that, I don't know the specifics of it, it was just sort of a general concept of do you see this type of um, conflict between the infrastructures and these legacy buildings kind of having to upgrade so that it can play in the current grid and stay online and still be an active part of the grid? Or because I'm only hearing like a third of what you said. <laughs> so, um, I what I, I so I'm not I can't so I'm in, I don't so I can't speak to the specifics. But what I can say is anyone who I'm sort of going back to my old days working for the grid operator. If you want to enter into New England, if you want to sell your electricity, and that can be through a power plant or it can be through a power line, you need to demonstrate to the ISO that you will not have an adverse impact on the current grid. And so those, those processes can be very time consuming and very costly. And that's about, so I, you know, I, 
beyond that, I can say if you want to come and you want to sell electricity to New England's consumers, you need to make sure that you're not going to adversely impact the grid. Okay, well, thank you all for the questions and for joining us today. It's been, it's been really great to, to be here, so thanks.